Good morning, faithful listener. You are listening to the Bible Explained podcast, where the Bible gets explained. So grab your cup of coffee and stay tuned as we read through the book of Deuteronomy. Hello and good morning, friends and faithful listeners. This is Jen with the Bible Explained podcast. And I am so excited because thanks to all of you faithful listeners out there, the Bible Explained podcast is now in the top 50 of philosophy podcasts in America, which for me is very exciting. Like, the <laughs> to me, that's really cool. The top 50 and it's like hovering between 30, the top 30 and the top 50 depending on the day. So thanks, guys. I appreciate the support in helping the Bible Explained podcast get to the top 50 of philosophy podcasts in America. But I especially want to thank, drum roll, Texas and California, <laughs> because you guys are tuning in the most out of all the states. And you guys are kind of like battling it out between the two of you, as you often do, it seems. <laughs> But yeah, Texas and California are actually tuning in more than my home state of Ohio. So thank you to anybody who lives in Texas or California and in Ohio, too. So introduce yourselves. If you live in California, let me know. Let me know what the weather is like where you guys live. And uh, same if you're in Texas. I would absolutely love to get to know you guys. So you're going to find the information in the bio of this podcast episode of how you can contact me. And also, if you want to go over to the website, I am still giving away two free chapters of my book out of the mic. Now, if you end up liking those two free chapters, you can get the rest of the book on Amazon. But for now, you can get the two free chapters of that book when you sign up for emails. But enough chit chat for today. Let's go ahead and read Deuteronomy 19 verses 1 through 14 today. I'll be reading out of the World English Bible or the WEB version. Please feel free to grab the version of the Bible you prefer to read out of, whatever that might be. And also make sure to grab that cup of coffee or that cup of tea on this sleepy, sleepy Friday morning. And let's read about the Avengers of blood today. It's a it's a great topic to discuss over our morning cup of coffee. <laughs> so once again, that's Deuteronomy 19, 1 through 14. When Yahweh your God cuts off the nations whose land Yahweh your God gives you, and you succeed them and dwell in their cities and in their houses, you shall set apart three cities for yourselves in the middle of your land, which Yahweh your God gives you to possess. You shall prepare the way and divide the borders of your land, which Yahweh your God causes you to inherit into three parts, that every manslayer may flee there. This is the case of the manslayer who shall flee there and live. Whoever kills his neighbor unintentionally and didn't hate him in past times, as when a man goes into the forest with his neighbor to chop wood and his hand swings the axe to cut down the tree and the head slips from the handle and hits its neighbor so that he dies, he shall flee to one of those cities and live. Otherwise, the avenger of blood might pursue the manslayer while hot anger is in his heart and overtake him because the way is long and strike him mortally, even though he was not worthy of death because he didn't hate him in times past. Therefore, I command you to set apart three cities for yourselves. If Yahweh God enlarges your border as he has sworn to your fathers and gives you all the land which he promised to give to your fathers, and if you keep all this commandment to do it, which I command you today, to love Yahweh your God and to walk ever in his ways, then you shall add three cities more for yourselves in addition to these three. This is so that innocent blood will not be shed in the middle of your land, which Yahweh your God gives you for an inheritance, leaving blood guilt on you. But if any man hates his neighbor, lies in wait for him, rises up against him, strikes him mortally so that he dies and flees into one of those cities, then the elders of that city shall send and bring him there and deliver him into the hand of the avenger of blood that he may die. Your eyes shall not pity him, but you shall purge the innocent blood from Israel that it may go well with you. You shall not remove your neighbor's landmark, which they of old time have set in your inheritance, which you shall inherit in the land that Yahweh your God gives you to possess. So as with everything in the Bible, when we look at the cities of refuge, you can see how they resemble God. Everything God does is with intention. And that's because the cities of refuge are basically God himself, or rather Jesus. When Jesus came down to earth, in a way, he kind of became our city of refuge. Because even though 
we sinned in times past, like, for example, this uh, this man who was a manslayer sinned. He didn't purposefully sin. And a lot of times we don't purposefully sin. But one way or the other, that manslayer had to flee to a city of refuge. And that's kind of the same with us. Sometimes we intentionally sin. Sometimes we don't. But regardless, sin just means falling short of the mark. And uh, when we unintentionally sin, it's still falling short of the mark because God, of course, is perfection. And we can't get into heaven without being perfect. That's why Jesus came down to rescue us. He was the perfect sacrifice that gave his life for us. But because we sin unintentionally or intentionally, we miss the mark. And so Jesus, when he came down to earth, became our city of refuge. And I'll explain that more in a minute once we talk about what a city of refuge uh, really is. So it says here that once God gives the Israelites some land, then three cities immediately are supposed to be set up as a city of refuge. And what this means is that a manslayer, not somebody who intentionally murdered somebody, but a manslayer could go to that city of refuge to basically save his life from the avenger of blood. The avenger of blood was somebody who was hired and it was like a legal thing. Actually, I found this out when I when I researched it. It was like a a legal role that the closest person to the man that was murdered would become the avenger of blood. And then he would go and murder the man who murdered his family member, which is very interesting to me that it was like a legal thing. It wasn't just like a, oh, I'm going to go kill this guy now because he murdered, you know, my brother or whatever. It was like a legal thing you had to go through in ancient days, which was really interesting to me personally. And so this is another thing where we see God coming down to the level of where the people were at the time. I mean, think about who God gave the law to. There was a lot of like tribalism going on. There was a lot of uh, just crazy things at the time that was going on. And God was like putting boundaries around a lot of that stuff. Not totally like overthrowing everything, because I think that could have been very chaotic had God been like, stop this, stop that, stop everything, which he did do a lot of that. But everything God does, he does with intention. God knows best. He knows the best way to proceed forward to help the people proceed forward, I suppose. So yes, God did not totally abolish the avenger of blood. Rather, he put laws, further laws and rules into place as to what the avenger of blood was and was not allowed to do. We actually see here that the avenger of blood was actually allowed to get his justice for his, let's just say his brother that was murdered, but it had to go through a court system. We can see that here. So the court would make sure that the murderer was truly a murderer, and then they would hand over the murderer to the avenger of blood. So now God is putting boundaries around the avenger of blood that he can't just go out and do whatever he wants to do. So let's see what verse one has to say here. So the three cities were supposed to be set for a person who was a manslayer. In other words, a manslayer was somebody who accidentally killed somebody. And God even gives an example here of an accidental killing. For example, the the two men go out into the woods to fell some trees and the axe head like flies off of the axe handle and accidentally hits the person next to him. That is not a murder. This man now who accidentally had the axe head like fly off the handle is a manslayer. And in order to flee the avenger of blood, he could go to a city of refuge. There were three cities that were supposed to be set up immediately specifically to protect manslayers because accidents because of a fallen world were always going to happen. Accidents are always going to happen. Manslaying, unfortunately, was always. And so God was protecting the manslayers, the people who accidentally sinned against somebody. So the manslayer would flee to one of these three cities that were set up and in that way, avoid being killed themselves by the Avenger of Blood. Because let's just say these two men were in the woods alone. It would look pretty suspicious that all of a sudden one of them is dead. The Avenger of Blood would then, you know, let's say it's the brother of the guy that was killed. He would be infuriated that his brother just died. And so he would want to go after the uh, the manslayer, not understanding, not even caring, probably, that he was a manslayer. 
because it looks very suspicious, right? So the Manslayer would flee and the Avenger of Blood was not allowed to kill in that city. There was absolutely no killing allowed in that city. He would uh, be killed himself if he went and killed the Manslayer in that city. So God's putting a lot of rules into place to protect everybody, if this makes sense, because God recognizes that the world has fallen. And so he's he's setting up these cities of refuge to compensate for the fact that the world is fallen. So when you think about it that way, you can definitely see how Jesus is our city of refuge. He's somebody we go to for refuge. He's somebody that saves us from our sins, right? Because that's kind of what these cities of refuge really were. And not only that, he forgives us, cleanses us from these sins and death no longer can touch us. So, I mean, it's really cool if you think about the analogies between the cities of refuge and Jesus. And I mean, there's so many times in scripture also where God is talked about as our refuge, which would point directly to these cities of refuge. I think David mentions that God is his refuge like so many times, like mentions that God is in a sense, his city of refuge. But not only were three cities supposed to be put up immediately once the Israelites go into the promised land, but once God expands their borders, three more cities were supposed to go up. And here's what it says in verse six. Otherwise, the avenger of blood might pursue the manslayer while hot anger is in his heart and overtake him because the way is long and strike him mortally, even though he was not worthy of death. So let's just say that uh, on the southern part of Israel, there's no city of refuge. A manslayer is in trouble and needs to get to a city of refuge as quickly as possible. One is just way too far away. And so God is saying, put three more cities up once I expand your border so that people that are far away from these cities will have a refuge to go to that is closer by. And these were big cities, by the way. For example, Hebron, which is one of the like most well-known cities in the Old Testament, was also a city of refuge. Hebron was huge. And we're, we're going to see the name Hebron come up a lot, especially in like first and second Kings, because I think David spent a lot of his time there. So these weren't just like itty bitty little cities, you know, these were cities that manslayers would be protected in, taken care of in a big refuge. There'd be stores, houses, just he would be able to live in that city comfortably. It wasn't just like an, a small little village. These were big fortified cities. So God is putting a lot of protection into place for those who, in a way, innocently sin because of a fallen world. And when I say sin, I say innocently miss the mark. Now, though, he talks about how in verses 9 through 13, that if a murderer, like somebody who truly set out to kill somebody and succeeded in killing somebody, if a murderer flees to a city of refuge... Then a trial was supposed to take place. (laughs) And if they found the man guilty of murder, they would immediately deliver that murderer to the avenger of blood. The avenger of blood would kill him. And here's what verses 12 through 13 says. It says, you shall deliver him into the hand of the avenger of blood that he may die. Your eye shall not pity him. According to God, a murderer was worthy of death. But here's an interesting thing I want you guys to notice here. In verse 11, it says, If any man hates his neighbor and lies in wait for him and rises up against him to strike him mortally so that he dies, notice that the first thing that happens here is hatred. Hatred of another person. We actually see in the New Testament that Jesus equates hatred with murder. It's like murder in one's own heart. If you hate somebody, in a sense, you are committing murder against them is what Jesus says. And I think nowadays we think of those as very harsh words. Oh, well, I'm not a murderer. I don't like that person. I I can't stand that person. I even hate that person, but I'm never, ever going to murder that person over there. But Jesus says, no, it's like the same thing. If you hate your brother in your heart, you are committing murder against him. 
So the first sin that was committed here was hatred against a neighbor. This is why we need to ask God to really help us, really, really help us not to hate our neighbors or our enemies or really anybody. We shouldn't hate anybody. And I mean, man, that's so hard when somebody is cruel to us, when somebody backstabs us or hurts us in some way or takes something from us that we view as precious to us. It is extremely hard not to hate that person. It is so hard. And human nature wants to hate that person, right? Like we kind of want to fester on it. We kind of want to think about it a lot. Actually, I just wrote a blog post about this. I was uh, struggling very badly with gossip towards somebody. And this has been going on for like a year. I've been having a really, really hard time with, uh, with this issue of gossip towards somebody. And God really showed me that uh, my gossiping mouth had a deeper, like, internal heart problem. And that heart problem was anger, extreme, extreme anger, which was leading to, at times, hatred against this person. And so it's like, man, you know, hatred is so easy to overlook. It's so easy also to encourage it even and like dismiss it as like nothing big. But God thinks of it as very big because it leads to other things. Hatred starts and then gossip starts and other things start. And in this case for this uh, murderer, murder happened because of the start of hatred in his heart. Now, Jesus, of course, talks about how we need to remove all these things. We need to remove hatred and gossip and everything else from our lives because that is not how Jesus lived. I mean, think about Jesus. If if there was anybody that had the right, I suppose, to hate somebody, it was Jesus. Because he's hanging up there on the cross after people betrayed him, after his friends betrayed him, after people are like spitting on him and abusing him and doing all this crazy stuff to Jesus. And he's there on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. Jesus had forgiveness in his heart. And because we are Christians, we are supposed to model that behavior towards other people. We are supposed to pray for them. I mean, what does it say in in scripture? Pray for your enemies and don't hate them. But the hope of everything is, is that God gives us like supernatural abilities to be able to forgive. Like that's part of the fruit of the spirit. We can forgive because of the Holy Spirit. And not only that, God offers intense forgiveness towards us when we sin. So because God is so insanely forgiving of us when we've missed the mark and because Jesus like literally gave his life for us, we've been granted forgiveness ourselves. And because Jesus modeled forgiveness, we should strive also to forgive other people. There's an awesome resource I really like, and I'm going to end with this. It's called The Steps to Freedom in Christ. I forget who it's written by. I've mentioned it before on this podcast. I love it. It's like a it's like a booklet and it's pretty cheap on Amazon. It's called The Steps to Freedom in Christ. And you can get oh, Neil T. Anderson. That's who wrote it. You can get that. And it goes through this whole thing on forgiveness. It's like a, a whole thing that you just like read through yourself and you can do it as often as you want to help gain forgiveness towards somebody. But it's a really, really good resource. It's something that I have picked up multiple times throughout the years to help me with. And it's not just about forgiveness. There's many different uh, things in there that somebody might struggle with. For example, like pornography addiction, if you're struggling with that, if you're struggling with like bitterness towards somebody, or if you're struggling with like fear towards something or whatever it might be, that book is really, really good. And I recommend it. I'm actually going to link that in the bio of the podcast episode, but also check out the rest of the links because you're going to find everything that P4E Ministries and myself do, not just the podcast, but the YouTube channel, the Facebook page and all that good stuff. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode. And I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Happy listening and God bless.